I'm happy to be saved. I hope you're saved this morning. And if you're saved, I hope you're glad about it. I hope you're walking with Jesus and growing in him and finding joy in life with Christ. Because, you know, even when everything is going badly and everything is difficult, and even when times are really hard, God is always good. He's always good and he's always faithful. And I'm thankful that I'm saved because of the blood of Jesus. And so on Resurrection Sunday, we want to talk about the blood of Jesus, but we want to talk this morning about exploring the evidence. And the title of the message this morning is simply that, exploring the evidence of Jesus. And our starting text this morning is in the book of Acts, chapter number one, where it says in verse one, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for the love of God that passes all understanding and comprehension. We thank you that as we look at this word, the, your word this morning, and as we, we speak these words, that you can be high and lifted up if our hearts are fixed on you. May we have ears that are open. May we have eyes that see the truth. And Father, if there's anyone here who doesn't know your precious son, may they find him today, find new life in Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. I heard the story, a story the other day about uh, a man that went on vacation to the Holy Land. And while he was there with his family, and his wife and her family and the mother-in-law, halfway through their trip, the mother-in-law passed away. And so the man goes to an undertaker who explains that they can send the body back home, but it's going to cost $5,000, or they can bury her in the Holy Land for $150. And the son-in-law said, let's just go ahead and send her home. And the undertaker said, are you sure about that? It's an awful big expense, and I can really provide a nice burial here. And the son-in-law said, look, 2,000 years ago, they buried a guy here, and three days later, he rose from the dead. I can't take that chance. That's really mean-spirited, and it's not the right spirit. But listen, the, the, man, the man in this joke begs the question, was there a man 2,000 years ago who really did come back from the dead? That's the question. And that's the question that needs to be answered, that begs to be answered by so many people today in our world. Maybe at some point in your life, you wanted to be a lawyer. That's something that some point in my teenage years, I considered, but very quickly moved on from that. Uh, but I was always intrigued by you know, the gathering of facts and the marshalling of arguments and presenting the case and defending a client and all those things that go along with it. And you know, some may even think that it's a, a glamorous life. But I want to read you some actual questions from lawyers this morning that were taken from official court records across the country. I promise you I'm not making these up, okay? Question. Now, doctor, isn't it true that when a person dies in his sleep, in most cases, he just passes quietly away and doesn't know anything about it until the next morning? <laughs> I'll just tell you there was no answer recorded. <clears throat> Number two, the question from the attorney, what happened then? Answer, he told me I have to kill you because I, I can, you can identify me. Next question, did he kill you? <laughs> question three. Was it you or your brother that was killed in the war? Again, no answer was returned. Number four, actual questions. I show you exhibit three and ask you if you recognize that picture. The answer was, that's me. Were you present when that picture was taken? Okay, number five. Now, Mrs. Johnson, how was your first marriage terminated? By death. And by whose death was it terminated? Okay, number six, Mrs. Jones, do you believe that you are emotionally stable? The answer was, I used to be. Question, how many times have you committed suicide? Again, they're not supposed to make sense. The, you'll get the point in just a minute, okay? Number seven, question, you say that the stairs went down to the basement. Answer, yes. And these stairs, did they also go up? One, one more. Number eight. Do you recall approximately the time that you examined the body of Mr. Edgington at the Rose Chapel? The answer was it was in the evening. The autopsy started about 8.30 p.m. 
And Mr. Edgington was dead at the time. Is that correct? Answer. This one was answered. No, he was sitting on the table wondering why I was doing an autopsy. <laughs> Sometimes questions beg answers. I hope I can do better this morning than these lawyers, because today I want to fulfill a purpose. And that purpose is I want to present to you the case for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Even though Jesus himself doesn't need any defense, he doesn't need me to defend him or anyone else, there's a lot uh, on the line as to whether or not he was raised from the dead. Even a doctor named Luke, who wrote two books of the Bible, one of which we read from a few moments ago, believed a legal defense was in order, and you're about to see that here in just a few moments. And, and I agree with him for this reason. Many people called Jesus just a great man. He's a great man. Others said he's a great teacher. Still others say he was a great philosopher. Almost everyone agrees he was a great moral example. But I contend he was none of the above if he died and did not come back. If he died and did not come back because he himself promised over and over that he would. Matthew chapter 16 verse 21, the Bible tells us from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Jesus himself taught it. Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, the son of man shall be betrayed into the hands of man. They shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorrow. Uh, sorry. Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19, the word of God says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall be conde and condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the, Galilean, uh, to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. Then what? And the third day he shall rise again. Jesus himself gave this testimony, Matthew 26, as we continue in Matthew, verse 32. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Jesus, Jesus said himself that he would rise again. The word of Jesus Christ, therefore, his integrity, his believability, his character is on the line. He said over and over that he would rise again. If he did not, he was a liar. I know for a fact this morning that he did because he dwells in my life and he's saved my soul. But there are those who are still on the fence. And the, my hope this morning is if you're on the fence, if you're not convinced, if you're struggling with this, that you will realize he is the risen Savior today. Dr. Luke was also very interested in the law and in legally defending the resurrection because he said in Acts chapter 3, or chapter 1, in the first part of verse 3, he said, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. He showed himself by many infallible proofs. There's one word for two English words, which are infallible proofs. It literally means a sure sign, a sure sign. So he said, he showed himself alive by many sure signs, many infallible, indisputable proofs, is what he's saying here. It comes from the legal term that refers to conclusive evidence that would hold up in a court of law. Just like Dr. Luke did 2,000 years ago today, we're going to explore the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I believe this is a subject worthy of the most detailed scrutiny and examination for one reason. The resurrection is either the greatest fact or the greatest farce in history. That's the bottom line. The resurrection is either the greatest fact or the greatest farce in history. Two billion people in the world today have staked their eternal destiny and their eternal lives on this truth that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. But there are still approximately 5.8 billion other people in the world where the jury is still out for them. So let's explore the evidence for Easter or the evidence of the resurrection. Number one, why should I believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Why should I believe in the resurrection of Jesus? I want to give you four incontrovertible, absolute, conclusive reasons why Jesus was raised from the dead. First of all, his body was buried. His body was buried. There is record of this. And so obviously before Jesus Christ could come back from the dead, he had to actually be dead. And there are many who say, well, Jesus didn't really die on the cross. And 
This is called the swoon theory. They say, well, they suggest Jesus just fainted on the cross, or, or, or maybe he just went into shock and, and fell unconscious, but he didn't really die. And it, it, just his, it just appeared as though he was dead. And when he was taken to that tomb, the cool air in the tomb revived him, and somehow he got out alive. In other words, he wasn't resurrected, he was just resuscitated. Well, there are several problems with this line of thinking. First of all, we're told in John 19.34 that, that just to make sure Jesus was dead, the Roman soldiers thrust a spear into his side between his ribs and punctured the sack around his heart. This is not only recorded in the Bible, which is the ultimate authority, but also recorded in, by other historians of the day as a clear fluid flowed with blood. And this is medical proof that Jesus Christ died because the blood had already begun to clot and separate from the watery serum. In case you doubt this, the article, an article in the Journal of the American Medical Society concluded, quote, clearly, the way that historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted and supports the traditional view that the spear probably perforated not only the right lung, but also the pericardium and heart, and thereby ensured his death. Accordingly, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Just in case you still don't believe he was dead, remember that he was wrapped in grave clothes. And if you know something about what they did to prepare the body in those days, the Jews would wrap their dead in the grave clothes and they would use a hundred pounds of spices that they would put into the folds of those grave clothes. And they would seal those clothes around the body like a mummy. They would wrap the head and before they wrapped the head, they would, they would fill the mouth and the nose cavity with spices and cloth. And the body would have been placed in a relatively airtight tomb little fresh air to breathe. So, so let's just suppose that somehow he got through all of that. Somehow. Well, then we have to believe that he was resuscitated in a cold tomb, took all of that grave clothes and all those bodily grave preparations off, left them neatly folded on the seat, took the hands that had been pierced by Roman nails and rolled away a stone that weighed several tons. And then somehow became like Chuck Norris and defeated and, and knocked out, took out all these Roman soldiers, some of the most elite of the Roman soldiers, and then on feet that had been pierced by Roman spikes, somehow ran off and found his disciples. I think I know what a judge would say at this point. Objection overruled. Secondly, the tomb was empty. His body was buried, but another evidence is that the tomb was empty. Remember, we saw Dr. Luke proudly said that there were many infallible or convincing proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One thing that has never been disputed in 2,000 years is this. The tomb was empty. For the very first time, the tomb was reported as empty. It was never denied. No one ever denied that the tomb was empty. These Roman guards who were put in charge of this tomb and to guard this tomb reported directly to the chief priests that the body was missing. And here was their reaction in Matthew 28, verses 12 and 13. When they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. <laughs> this was their solution. Immediately, the response was to try to explain away the resurrection. They wanted to explain it away. Now think about how absurd this cover-up really was. The guards were told to spread the story that Jesus' body had been stolen in the middle of the night by the disciples while they were sleeping, the soldiers, and carried away. Now, I don't know if any court in the world <laughs> would, would allow a witness to testify of what was happening when he was asleep. Do you? I, you don't really know much of what's happening when you're asleep. In fact, the soldiers, if they had been asleep, how would they know who came and stole the body? I know a judge would say in this case, objection overruled. So we have to ask the question, why would the chief priest come up with this kind of story? That's well, simple. If the tomb was empty, if Jesus was not in that tomb, 
after those three days, either somebody took him out or God took him out of there. Amen. He raised himself. So let's suppose that human beings took Jesus out of the tomb just, just for a minute. Let's just suppose that. There were only two options. It either had to be his friends or it had to be his foes. Those are the only two options. So what's the possibility that his friends stole his body? Now, there's three obstacles to that. First of all, there, there were the soldiers guarding the tomb. These soldiers were the best that the Romans had to offer. They were special forces, if you want to call them that. 16 well-trained, highly disciplined men carrying six-foot spears and a three-foot sword and a dagger and a shield. <laughs> it's a far stretch to think that the disciples came who just three days earlier had yellow streaks down their backs a mile wide as they ran from Jesus like cowards. Now they're going to come back and attempt to overpower 16 elite Roman guards and take the body of Jesus? Beyond the soldiers, there was a stone, a stone that was rolled on in front of the tomb. These stones weighed many tons, and it sat in a groove that rolled downward to the mouth of the tomb. It would have taken up to 20 strong men to move this type of a stone. So yet the New Testament tells us the stone was picked up and moved by a tremendous force a good distance. There was also the seal. Remember the seal? We're told that the stone was rolled in front of the tomb and it was given the Roman seal. And once that stone was in place, it was steel, sealed with wax and it was stamped with the Roman sign. And the soldiers knew that if they went to sleep on their watch and that seal was broken, the law said they would be burned alive with their clothes still on. And the penalty for sleeping or allowing a Roman seal to be broken, either one, was death. So I know what a judge would say to this so-called evidence. Objection overruled. There's another possibility. If the body wasn't removed by his friends, then maybe it was removed by his foes, his enemies. But of course, that's absurd. His, his foes were doing everything possible to keep him in the tomb, not to get him out. If they had taken the body, and why would they want to make it look as though Jesus was raised from the dead? The truth is his friends couldn't remove his body. His foes couldn't remove his body. Objection overruled. His body was buried. The tomb was empty. Another evidence is that lives were changed. Whenever Jesus is around, lives are changed. There's a tremendous number of people who were willing to bear witness that they had seen Jesus Christ alive. In fact, when you put all the scriptures together and you total everyone up that saw Jesus appear on 10 different occasions over a period of six weeks, at least 516 witnesses, somewhere in that range. He appeared in the morning, he appeared in the afternoon, he appeared in the evening, he appeared indoors, he appeared outdoors. Now, when you stop and think that if each of these witnesses was brought to a court, and, and just suppose they were allowed to testify for 30 minutes each about their encounter with the risen Lord, he would have over 250 hours of testimony. Can you imagine the verdict of a of a jury if over 500 witness, witnesses testified to the same thing, corroborating one another 500 times over. It may also remind you that many of these witnesses sealed their testimony with their own blood, meaning they suffered torture. They were beheaded. They were imprisoned. They were crucified. Think about what happened to the disciples. History says that before Easter, they were dejected because they thought Jesus was dead. They were hiding behind closed doors, didn't know what to do. They were scared for their lives. Yet after Easter, after the resurrection, the disciples went out boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ is alive. All of, all of these disciples, but one, suffered horrible, violent deaths. But none of them ever disavowed their testimony. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, literally rose from the dead. And it's a psychological fact, you can look it up, that no one will willingly give their life for what they know to be a lie. No one will ever die for something that they know is not true. So once again, I hear a judge crying out, objection overruled. Let's look at one more. Not only was his body buried and the tomb was empty and lives were changed, but the church was born. The church was born. There's no other reason. 
There's no other explanation of the church than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There would be no church had he not risen from the dead. After he rose from the dead, once he ascended to heaven, he sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, who empowered the church and people preached. Old Peter, who had denied Jesus three times not long before, was preaching. And in a single sermon, 5,000 people gave their life to Christ. What causes that kind of a change? Life. The life-giving blood of Jesus. There's no other explanation of that Christians uniquely worship on Sunday, the first day of the week. Why is that? The Lord's Day, Resurrection Day. There's no other explanation that before you can join a true New Testament church, you have to confess that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord and accept the resurrection. So, now I'm not a lawyer, as you well know. So maybe you'd like to hear this from one of the most successful or the most successful trial attorney in the entire world. The Guinness Book of World Records says the most successful attorney in history is a man named Sir Lionel Lecu, who succeeded in getting 245 consecutive murder acquittals in his legal career. Nobody's ever even come close to that besides him. This man who was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth took his expertise in law. He went through the question of whether or not Jesus Christ rose from the dead and whether that evidence would stand legal trial. And this is what he concluded. And I quote, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Now, it doesn't matter what he says, because we know what God said. But when we look at the evidence, the evidence is indisputable. You don't have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but you do have to deny overwhelmingly to the contrary if you reject it. If I were a skeptic, though, I'd still have one more question. So what? So what? I've answered the question of why. Why I should believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but now I want to answer one last question, and that's number two. Why should I receive the Jesus of the resurrection? Why should I receive him? Everyone on this earth dies. Everyone will die either having rejected Jesus Christ or having received Jesus Christ. And I want to share with you four simple reasons why you should receive him. First of all, so your sins can be forgiven. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, the word of God says, Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Don't miss what this verse says here. Anybody can claim to die for the sins of the world. Anybody can claim that Jesus died for the sins of the world. But think about this. Jesus died on a cross, supposedly as the payment for the sins of the world. But how do I know that God accepted that sacrifice? That's the so what question. How do I know it matters? How, how do I know that the, the check didn't bounce, so to speak? How do I know that he really was the son of God and that he really could pull that off? The empty tomb is proof that God accepted the payment. If the tomb had not been empty, the payment would not have been accepted and there would be no hope and no resurrection and no life. But because the tomb is empty, that sealed the deal. It was finished. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. When he rose again from the dead, he held the keys to death and hell. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The next reason that you should receive him as your Savior, not only so your sins can be forgiven, but so you can have life of purpose. You can live a life of purpose. Did you know that there is meaning to life? It's very simple. People throughout all of the ages have tried to discover the meaning of life, and it is found in three words, to know God. That's the meaning of life. That's why God created all of this. That's why he gave his son Jesus, so we could know him. You can have purpose. The vast majority of people in this world, in fact, the vast majority of people who live right here in this country, are not living. They're just existing. People are just existing. I hope you understand that we're not put on this earth just to get up in the morning and to go to work and to come home and to watch TV and to go to bed and to get up again and do it all over and then eventually die. There is something more to life than physical existence. And we all understand that at our core because we are spiritual beings. 
There is something more. God put you here for a purpose. He has a plan for your life, and it starts with you living a real life, the only life that can be found through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, in the last part, he said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He wants us to have abundant life, not just an existence, but to have a bountiful, abundant life, life of purpose. You can't even understand or experience what real life is all about until you've discovered the risen Savior. Because that's where life really begins. At the moment of salvation, we will then never die. Whoever lives and believes in Jesus, he said, that person will never die. Will this earthly body cease to function one day? Yes. If I live to the point that this body gives up before Jesus comes, this body of flesh will stop to function. But Gary Fox II will not die. I am alive forever because of the hope of Jesus, because of the resurrection, because of the power of the blood. The fact that Jesus came back from the grave and that Jesus came out of the tomb tells me that death does not have the final say in my life and death cannot conquer me. I can conquer death through Christ. The resurrection of Jesus means that when it came to the time in my life that it comes to an end, eventually the life will come to an end. When I'm about to take my last breath, when I've seen my last sunrise and my last sunset, I can say, Just like 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You see, Jesus paid it all. Your sins can be forgiven. You can have a life of purpose. You can conquer death by receiving Christ. And then the last one is, so you can receive eternal life. You can't receive eternal life and you can't go to heaven unless A, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and B, you believed that and received him as your Lord. You have to know that it's true and then accept it by faith. Knowing that it's true doesn't save you. Accepting him by faith is where it comes, where salvation comes. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So we've explored the evidence this morning. Now you have to make a decision. The decision. Who are you going to invest your hope in for eternal life? So the evidence screams out at us that Jesus Christ told the truth when he said in John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. I've given you evidence this morning that demands a verdict. What are you going to do about it? You have to decide not only whether the evidence is true, but whether you will believe it this morning. That's the most important decision of your eternal life. Let's stand together with heads bowed and eyes closed. Father, we come before you this morning and we are humbled and grateful for the sacrifice of your son. And we are grateful that your word is true and your word is all we need as evidence and proof of our risen Lord and eternal life through him. But we are thankful that even as we look at physical evidence and historical evidence, the fact is clear that Jesus lived among us, that Jesus gave his life and died and was buried and came out of that tomb. There is evidence of the power of saving grace to care for and love others and reach out to them with the same knowledge of Jesus, that they might be saved. I pray this morning, God, that you would speak to any heart in this room, lovingly draw them. If they have not received you, anyone who may be watching or listening that does not know you, may your Holy Spirit very strongly and lovingly compel them to see the truth and to be set free by the blood of Jesus. We ask for your help in this invitation time in Jesus' name. Amen.